Okay, this is Miss Dennison. I'm going to go over Chapter 20. Um, this is Nursing Management of the Pregnancy at Risk. These are some of the conditions that we're going to talk about um, on the next uh, slides. Um, so, basically, one of the biggest um, things that is important is mom must have strict glucose control for an optimal pregnancy outcome. Um, and we have to place so much emphasis on preconception counseling, um, especially for moms who are at risk. So diabetes, um, we have type one. Um, this is 5%. These are absolute insulin deficiency. Um, and it's usually due to an autoimmune process. Type two is insulin resistance or deficiency, but this is related to obesity and sedentary lifestyle. Um, impaired fasting glucose and impaired glucose tolerance. This is um, when they are hyperglycemic, but they do not meet the diagnostic criteria for actual diabetes. That's um, fasting blood sugar 100 to 125, and after two hours, um, 140 to 199, after two hours after meals. Um, with these moms, the newborn is still at risk for um, being large for gestational age. Gestational diabetes, um, this, the glucose intolerance um, the onset is during pregnancy or it's first detected in pregnancy, usually around 24 weeks. And that is as high as 10% of um, pregnant moms in the USA. <clears throat> Basically, when um, moms, when mom becomes pregnant, um, her metabolic system is already compromised. So to have diabetes has significant effects on her. Um, normal hormonal adaptations of pregnancy will regardless affect her glycemic control. Um, pregnancy may accelerate the progress of vascular complications with diabetes. Uh, nausea and vomiting will uh, result in dietary fluctuations that can affect the glucose levels of mom. Also cravings. So mama wants ice cream at 3 a.m. Hey, there's just some cravings. Gestational diabetes can lead to macrosomia, hypoglycemia, birth trauma, preeclampsia. Um, mom needs strict glycemic control prior to conception. An increased hemoglobin A1c will increase the risk of infant encephalopathy, microcephaly, and congenital heart disease. So let's talk about diabetes. Um, I know we have uh, went through it before, but just as a little remembrance. Um, so insulin is a hormone. It is made by the pancreas. Basically, what insulin does is it allows your body to use sugar or glucose from the carbohydrates that we eat in food for energy or to store the glucose for future use. Insulin helps keep your blood sugar level from getting too high, which is called hyperglycemia, or too low, which is hypoglycemia. The cells in your body have to have energy, and they need sugar for energy. The sugar cannot go into most of your cells directly. After you eat food, your blood sugar level will rise. Beta cells in your pancreas are then signaled to release insulin into your bloodstream to counteract that glucose. Insulin will then attach to and signal cells to absorb the sugar from the bloodstream. It's often described as a key. It unlocks the cell to allow sugar to enter the cell and be used for energy. If you have more sugar in your body than it needs, insulin will help store that sugar in your liver 
and releases it when your blood sugar level is low or if you need more sugar, like if, if it's in between meals or uh, during physical activity. Insulin will help balance out those blood sugar levels and keep them in a normal range. Now, as blood sugar levels rise, that pancreas will secrete more and more insulin. <clears throat> if your body does not produce enough insulin or your cells are resistant to the effects of insulin, <clears throat> you may develop hyperglycemia or high blood glucose. This can cause long-term complications, especially if that blood sugar stays elevated for an extended period of time. The insulin will regulate that blood glucose by enabling that glucose to enter adipose or fat tissue and muscle cells where, again, it is used for energy. But if that insulin is insufficient, glucose accumulates in the bloodstream. This causes cellular dehydration and expanded blood volume, which in turn, the kidneys start to excrete large volumes of urine, also called polyuria, in an attempt to regulate that excess vascular volume and excrete all that unusable glucose. That's when you see glycosuria when you have sugar in your urine. Polyuria, which is um, the kidneys excreting the large volumes of, of urine, along with that cellular dehydration, will cause excessive thirst, also called polydipsia. Your body will then compensate for the inability to convert that carbohydrate glucose into energy by burning protein and, and fat. Well, when they start to burn that protein and fat, basically the end products of that metabolism are ketones and fatty acids. So when those are in excess in the bloodstream, it will cause ketoacidosis and acetonuria. Then mom will be weight, losing weight, and that is due to the breakdown of that fat and muscle tissue. It basically, that tissue breakdown will cause a state of starvation, compelling mom to eat excessive amounts of food, also known as polyphagia. <clears throat> Over time, diabetes can cause significant changes in both the large and the small vessels, so microvasculature and macrovasculature circulations. That's in the heart, the eyes, the kidneys and the nerves. Some of the complications resulting from diabetes, premature atherosclerosis, buildup in those vessels, retinopathy, which can cause blindness, neuropathy, which of course can cause pain and inability to feel, and nephropathy, which is issues with your kidneys. Now, if mom goes into DKA, which is diabetic ketoacidosis, this is an emergency. So this can occur in pregnant women with blood glucose levels at 200 compared with 300 to 350 in non-pregnant women. Also, if there's an illness or infection, which as some of us know, just being pregnant is a source of stress um, it causes hyperglycemia because of an increased hepatic glucose production. Stress hormones or cortisol is released. That will impair insulin action and further contribute to insulin deficiency. Now, <clears throat> so then that metabolic acidosis will develop. The excess blood glucose and ketones will result in osmotic diuresis, which is loss of fluid and electrolytes, volume depletion, and cellular dehydration. So there's a whole big circular motion of all the things working against your body. DKA is a medical emergency. It can result in maternal coma and death. It can lead to intrauterine fetal death at 
any time during the pregnancy. Interuterine fetal death used to be up to 35% in these, in these patients. Now it's at 10 percent so there's better monitoring now um, but also the risk of hypoglycemia will increase during all this often in the first trimester and during sleep so those fasting states the hypoglycemic episodes don't really appear to have much damaging effects on the fetal well-being however hyperglycemic episodes do Perinatal mortality rate is still three times higher for diabetic women. In the first trimester, glycemic control is critical. Hypervigilance, the first trimester when the cardiovascular system and the central nervous system are developing in that fetus, um, basically keeping that blood sugar controlled will help to prevent congenital malformations, extreme prematurity, intrauterine fetal death. Also, it will decrease the chance of placental insufficiency, fetal growth restriction, macrosomia, polyhydramnios, and obstructed labor. The fetus, its pancreas, starts to secrete insulin at 10 to 14 weeks. The fetus then secretes large amounts of insulin in response to mom's blood sugar level. Insulin acts as a growth hormone in these fetuses, causing them to produce excess stores of sugar, protein, and adipose tissue, meaning the fetus will increase in size, aka macrosomia. <clears throat> also, they are more at risk for birth injuries, um, such as brachial plexus palsy, humerus or clavicle fracture, facial nerve injury, cephalhematoma, difficult vaginal birth, and shoulder dystocia. So again, the first trimester, um, mom is prone to hypoglycemia. Um, glucose crosses the placenta to the fetus, but insulin doesn't. Maternal and fetal glucose levels are directly proportional to each other. So mom's blood sugar is here, baby's blood sugar is here. The second and third trimesters, that ins that um, all the hormones, cortisol, all that will increase insulin resistance. And that basically is a glucose sparing mechanism that ensures that the baby has an abundant supply of glucose. Maternal insulin requirements gradually increase from about 18 to 24 weeks until about 36 weeks and may even double or quadruple by the end of pregnancy. In a normal pregnancy, there is an increase in glomerular filtration rate. So those kidneys are working hard, getting rid of all that stuff, um, getting rid of any kind of extra blood sugar. Um, at birth, the expulsion of the placenta prompts an abrupt drop in levels of circulating placental hormones, cortisol, and insulinase. Maternal tissues quickly regain their pre-pregnant sensitivity to insulin. For non-breastfeeding patients, pre-pregnancy insulin to carbohydrate balance usually returns in about seven to 10 days. Lactation uses maternal glucose, so insulin requirements will, re will remain low during lactation. After weaning, pre-pregnancy insulin requirement is established. These are just um, basically issues that mom can have and issues that baby can have with a diabetic mom. Um, ketoacidosis for mom, high blood pressure for mom, um, can have stillbirth, hypoglycemia, UTI due to nephropathy, um, difficult lab labor, postpartum hemorrhage. The baby can have macrosomia, 
birth trauma because it's so big. Um, congenital anomalies, especially if that blood sugar is elevated during that first trimester when all the things are really developing. Because um, they're big, they may have a cord prolapse. Um, they're more at risk for hypoglycemia, <coughs> respiratory distress, um, that uh, the respiratory distress syndrome results because of poor surfactant production due to hyperinsulinemia. Um, also, it increases the risk of childhood obesity and also neonatal death. Preconception counseling is absolutely imperative. It is associated with less perinatal mortality and fewer congenital anomalies. So it is encouraged that mom establishes that glycemic control before pregnancy. Excellent control of blood glucose um, is evidenced when the fasting blood glucose is normal and a glycemic glycosylated hemoglobin or hemoglobin A1C is less than 7%. Now, a value of greater than 8% indicates poor control and warrants intervention. You need to educate that pregnancy will worsen vascular changes within a diabetic. Um, also, educate on coronary artery disease, retinal hemorrhages, renal insufficiency, Make sure, make sure she understands the financial implications um, related to that close and frequent maternal fetal surveillance. Um, she's probably going to have to be at the doctor's office way more than a normal woman who is not a diabetic. Um, also, educate on contraception to plan effectively. Barrier con contraception methods are preferred for a diabetic. Um, hormonal Contraception methods may be risky because they do increase the risk of DVTs, vascular complications. <coughs> um, educate on dietary management, skin care. Uh, she needs to wear a medical alert bracelet. She needs to carry insulin supplies and a glucose booster everywhere that she goes. Uh, make sure she has good hygiene and foot care due to neuropathy. Um, we don't want her getting a uh, foot ulcer and so forth. She also needs to realize the importance of eating on time. Also encourage breastfeeding as it has an anti-diabetogenic effect for the child and the patient. Again, we have to establish glycemic control pre-pregnancy. <clears throat> um, during pregnancy, strict blood sugar control with fasting blood sugar less than 92 and one and two hour postprandial after meals needs to be less than 180 and two hour postprandial needs to be less than 153. Nutritional management may be all that is necessary to balance those glucose levels. Diet is the mainstay of treatment. Um, mom is placed on a standard diabetic diet, usually 30 kilocalories per kilogram per day. Um, this is based on her normal preconception, so pre-pregnancy weight. So if she's 154 pounds, that means she's 70 kilograms. So she needs to be on a 2100 calorie per day diet. Um, also, it is recommended um, that diet or insulin is used to achieve a one hour postprandial blood glucose level of 130. Now, medication wise, we have globuride and metformin. These do not cross the placenta and may be considered safe, effective, and economical for the treatment of gestational diabetes. Um, a lot of times this is given to um, achieve glucose control using if she doesn't want to use insulin or maybe she can use less insulin. Uh, metformin decreases hepatic glucose production and increases peripheral sensitivity to insulin. Globuride is most frequently prescribed. Minimal amounts cross the placenta and it works by causing the maternal pancreas to produce more insulin. 
It should be taken at least 30 minutes, preferably an hour, before a meal so that the peak effect covers two hours postprandial blood sugar level. Um, you need to educate mom that she always needs to carry a fast sugar source for hypoglycemia. Um, and also exercise and fetal surveillance is encouraged. There's really not been many published studies on the benefit of exercise in women with gestational diabetes, um, but in patients that are not pregnant, exercise will increase lean muscle mass and improves the sensitivity to insulin. Therefore, a moderate exercise program is recommended for overweight or obese women with gestational diabetes in order to improve that blood sugar control and facilitate weight loss. So as the nurse, you're going to be assessing mom, um, those with uh, high risk to have diabetes. Um, those placental hormones will kick in during the second trimester. Um, so usually they are, they'll have a one hour glucose tolerance test around 24 to 28 weeks. If they flunk that, um, then they are ordered a three hour glucose tolerance test. They will then eat a high carb diet for three days. They'll then fast after midnight. They're given 100 grams of sugar after drawing a fasting blood sugar. And one or more abnormal values will confirm diagnosis of gestational diabetes. So um, at one hour, 180 or less, two hours one, less than 153, and three hours less than 140. And again, if they are high risk, they need to be screened at the first prenatal visit. Postpartum, most will return to normal glucose levels after birth. Um, fasting blood sugar should be checked yearly. Mom has a 35 to 60% chance of developing type 2 diabetes within 20 years. Obesity is a major risk factor for later development of diabetes, so encourage weight loss and exercise. Also, the child is at risk for developing obesity. So, of course, you need a good HMP, assess for risk factors um, for hypoglycemia, um, educate mom that she may experience sweating, tremors, cold, clammy skin, headache, be hungry, uh, blurred vision, disorientation, irritability. Um, treat that with eight ounces of milk and two graham crackers or two glucose tablets. For hyperglycemia, um, she may experience dry mouth, frequent urination, excessive thirst, rapid breathing, tired, flushed, hot, dry skin, headache, drowsiness, um, and this definitely warrants further investigation. The only type of insulin that can be given IV are rapid acting insulins. Um, this is your Humulog, Apedra, and Novolog. So your Lispro, your Glulosine, your Aspart. Um, during labor, you're going to monitor closely for dehydration, um, also blood sugar levels. Usually, it's possible to maintain glucose control um, by simply avoiding dextrose fluids. An IV line is established for maintenance fluids, normal saline, or lactated ringer um, is usually given, possibly has to be changed to D5 during active labor. That's just going to give her some extra energy. An insulin infusion of rapid or short acting insulin is usually piggybacked into um, a main line. Blood sugars are monitored hourly. Um, you want those glucose levels to be maintained between 80 and 110, decreasing the incidence of neonatal hypoglycemia. Continuous fetal monitoring during labor. Um, mom needs to be in an upright or sideline position during bed rest, preventing supine hypotension. 
because that baby is probably going to be a lot bigger um, or she may have a lot more fluid. So you're going to observe for and treat hyperglycemia, ketosis, and ketoacidosis. Um, a neonatal specialist or pediatrician should be present for birth in these cases. If a C-section is planned, uh, usually those are scheduled early in the morning. That's going to help to facilitate that glycemic control. Um, and of course, there'll be NPO. An epidural anesthesia is recommended because hypoglycemia can be detected earlier if awake, so you don't really want to knock her out. And you're going to monitor both mom and baby's blood sugar levels carefully post-op. Um, usually a sliding scale insulin is given until she resumes a regular diet. Fetal surveillance, um, an ultrasound is usually completed often um, for fetal growth activity to validate gestational age. Um, AFP levels um, can detect congenital anomalies. Um, sometimes a fetal echocardiogram can be done, a biophysical profile, um, non-stress test after 28 weeks. Also an amniocentesis for that lecithin sphingomyelin, the LS ratio, um, and presence of phosphatidyl glycerol to evaluate that fetal lung maturity. So these are congenital heart defects that are um, pre present at birth, and we'll talk about each one in the following slides. About 1% of pregnancies are complicated by serious heart disease. Heart disease is the number one killer of women. 3% of pregnant women have cardiovascular disease, which is responsible for 10 to 25% of maternal deaths. Men and women with congenital heart disease are at increased risk of having children who also have congenital heart disease. Risk factors include hypertension, high cholesterol, smoking, lack of physical activity, and obesity. Also, menopause and oral contraceptives will raise that risk. Classic symptoms of heart disease mimic common symptoms of late pregnancy, such as palpitations, shortness of breath with exertion, um, occasional chest pain, now, few women with heart disease die during pregnancy, but they are at risk for heart failure, arrhythmias, and stroke. The offspring are at risk of complications such as preterm birth, low birth weight for gestational age, intrauterine growth restriction because of low oxygen pressure in the mom, fetal congenital heart lesions, intravascular hemorrhage, and death. Now, the tetralogy of Fallot involves four heart defects in one. So you're going to have a large ventral septal defect, which you can see right here, the difference in a normal and that heart. Um, also pulmonary stenosis. That is basically obstructing uh, the right ventricle outflow to the lungs and the pulmonary valve which is never good. Also, right ventricular hypertrophy and an overriding aorta. Now, tetralogy of Fallot is the most common cyanotic heart disease that is observed during pregnancy. The components are the ventral septal defect, pulmonary stenosis, overriding aorta, and the right ventricular hypertrophy. This leads to a right to left shunt. So women with tetralogy of the low are encouraged to have it corrected before conception because once that ventral septal, septal defect and pulmonary stenosis have been repaired, pregnancy does not pose a significant risk. But if it's left uncorrected, um, women will experience more right to left shunning during pregnancy. Um, that can reduce, that will result in reduced blood flow through that pulmonary circulation, increasing hypoxemia, leading to possible syncope or death. 
maintaining Venus return with uncorrected tetralogy of below is critical. Most dangerous in the late third trimester and the early postpartum period when Venus return is reduced by that large pregnant uterus and by peripheral venous pooling after birth. Use of pressure graded support hose is absolutely recommended and also prophylactic antibiotics should be given during the intrapartum period. The major cardiovascular changes occurring during pregnancy um, and affect the woman with cardiac disease are of course that increased intravascular volume that the heart has to figure out what to do with all that fluid, um, a decreased systemic vascular resistance, cardiac output changes occurring during labor and birth, and the intravascular volume changes that occur just after birth, so that extra diuresis. During a normal pregnancy, um, the normal heart can compensate for this increased workload. Um, but the diseased heart can be hemodynamically challenged. Cardiac failure can develop during pregnancy, labor, or the postpartum period. Um, so with atrial septal defect, this is one of the most common that are seen during pregnancy. One cause of the left to right shunt, it may, it may go undetected as the woman is usually asymptomatic. Um, it results in most likely an uncomplicated pregnancy, but some women may have right-sided heart failure or arrhythmias due to that increased plasma volume. A ventricular septal defect, um, it's also a cause of left to right shunning, and it's usually diagnosed and corrected early in life. Women with small uncomplicated ventral septal defects usually have no pregnancy complications, but if it's large, um, they can have arrhythmias, heart failure, and pulmonary hypertension. So the treatment of this is rest, decreased physical activity, and anticoagulants. A patent ductus arteriosus also causes left to right shunt, usually diagnosed and corrected in infancy. The coarctation of the aorta, if at all possible, should be corrected surgically before pregnancy. However, um, pregnancy is usually safe for the woman with an uncorrected, um, uncomplicated defect. <clears throat> Complications can include hypertension, congestive heart failure, infective endocarditis, stroke, aortic dissection, aneurysm, and rupture. Um, rest, beta blockers, vaginal birth, an epidural, short second stage with vacuum or forceps extraction if necessary, and prophylactic antibiotics are given at birth. Acquired um, heart disease, these are conditions that affect the heart and is associated, um, it's associated blood vessels that develop during the person's lifetime, not at birth. Um, mitral valve uh, stenosis. Basically, this uh, is a lesion resulting from rheumatic heart disease. Uh, the opening of the mitral valve will narrow. The valve leaflets will stiffen. The blood flow will be obstructed from the left atrium to the left ventricle. So that's going to decrease the cardiac output. When the mitral valve narrows, shortness of breath will worsen. It occurs first on exertion, then eventually rest. Pregnancy with a mitral valve stenosis can result in pulmonary edema, atrial fibrillation, right-sided heart failure, infective endocarditis, pulmonary embolism, and massive hemoptysis, which is um, blood, coughing up blood. Um, diuretics are given to prevent pulmonary edema, beta blockers and calcium channel blockers um, are given to prevent tachycardia, digoxin, cardioversion, anticoagulant therapy is usually given um, for those with the mitral valve stenosis. It's encouraged to decrease activity, restrict sodium, monitor weight, 
um, echocardiograms to uh, monitor that cardiomegaly. Also prophylaxis for interpartum endocarditis with antibiotics and pulmonary infection for women who is at high risk. It's best to have a valvoplasty before getting pregnant. Now a mitral valve prolapse is usually benign um, and, very, and fairly common. The leaflets of the mitral valve prolapse into the left atrium, um, basically allowing backflow of blood. A mid-systolic click and la uh, late systolic murmur uh, basically are hallmarks of this system syndrome. Most of the time it's asymptomatic. Sometimes they may have atypical chest pain and usually pregnancy, labor, and birth are safe and usually well tolerated. Aortic stenosis, this is the narrowing of the opening of the aortic valve leading to an obstruction to the left ventricular ejection. It's uh, rarely encountered because it usually develops after childbearing years are over. Um, basically same medical management as uh, mitral valve stenosis, beta blockers, antiarrhythmics. Now peripartum cardiomyopathy, um, congestive heart failure with cardiomyopathy, that's the enlargement of the heart muscle. Uh, the criteria is basically the development of congestive heart failure within the last month of pregnancy or within five months postpartum. Also absence of heart disease before the last month of pregnancy, a left ventricular ejection fraction of less than 45%, and a lack of another cause of congestive heart failure. Usually the cause is unknown, could be genetic, nobody really knows. Um, symptoms are usually dyspnea, fatigue, edema, cardiomegaly, which is again the enlargement of that heart muscle. In half the women, uh, the left ventricular dysfunction will resolve within six months. If not, 85% of those left over will die in the next four to five years. Um, she will be given diuretics, afterload reduction with vasodilators, uh, anotropic agents, salt restriction, and exercise. Myocardial infarction, that is a heart attack. Um, these are usually rare, but they can occur. Um, usually it's in the third trimester. If it is in the last month of pregnancy through the first few months postpartum, mortality will approach to 20%. And those numbers are rising due to uh, the obesity rate rising. More likely they're gonna have preeclampsia, um, possibly eclampsia, antepartal or postpartal MIs are most likely related to diabetes, coronary artery disease, and lipid disorders. So these women are given anticoagulation, rest, and you know, nitroglycerin, all the things. Eisenmenger syndrome is a right to left shunt with elevated pulmonary vascular resistance. Um, pregnancy should be avoided because of the risk of poor pregnancy outcomes with this. There's 50% mortality rate of mothers and fetus. Um, also a heart transplant may uh, you know, she may have had a heart transplant. Women are advised to avoid pregnancy for at least one year after a transplant. Woman needs to be stable on her immunosuppressant medication and have normal cardiac function and no evidence of rejection. So prophylactic antibiotics are given um, to moms with a prosthetic heart valve, a history of infective endocarditis, unrepaired congenital heart disease, a congenital heart defect repaired with prosthetic material or um, with a residual defect or at or in adjacent to the, to the repair site, and of course cardiac transplant recipients who develop cardiac valvulo, valvulopathy. Um, you're going to monitor drug levels, iron, vitamins, folic acid, antibiotics are given, anticoagulants are given um, because those clotting factors do increase during pregnancy. They're more at risk for clots. Heparin is safe because it does not cross the placenta. Um, Lovenox can also be given 
Coumadin does cross the placenta and is teratogenic. Do not give that to mom. Um, this should be discontinued at time of labor and reactivated within six hours um, of vaginal birth or 12 to 24 hours post C-section. Thiazide diuretics of Lasix is used to treat CHF. This does cross the placenta but does not have any known teratogenic effects on the fetus. Digitalis glycosides such as digoxin is used to treat cardiac heart failure. Um, this does cross the placenta but does not have any known teratogenic effects on the fetus. Antiarrhythmics are given used only to treat serious arrhythmias. Um, these do cross placenta, no teratogenic effects. Um, digoxin, quinidine, procainamide, nitroglycin, and propranolol are the main ones that are given. Conditions that <clears throat> contribute to heart disease are more common in women. Um, the woman's ability to function during pregnancy is often more important than the actual diagnosis of cardiac condition. So the classification system, it can change as the pregnancy progresses. A woman with class four disease should avoid pregnancy altogether. A class one, asymptomatic, no limitation of physical activity. Um, class two, symptomatic, dyspnea and chest pain with increased activity. They are comfortable at rest. These can go through pregnancy, usually without major complications. Class three, um, symptomatic of fatigue, palpitations with normal activity and comfortable at rest. These usually have to maintain bed rest during pregnancy. And class four, again, should be advised to avoid pregnancy. Those are symptomatic at rest or any physical activity. So congenital and uh, acquired heart disease. Um, those changes are definitely stressing mom's heart out. Um, as the nurse, you're going to be assessing vital signs, listening to that heart, checking those daily weights, um, monitoring that fetal activity and growth, um, educating on signs of preterm labor, teaching the importance of medication, the need for them to conserve energy to decrease that um, workload on the heart. Therapeutic management, prevention of infection, vaccinations against flu and pneumonia. Um, any kind of infections need to be treated promptly, advising her to prevent excessive weight gain. So she needs to be on a well-balanced diet with iron and folic acid supplements. High protein, adequate calories may need to be on a decreased sodium diet and she will definitely need adequate potassium intake. Um, you need to promote rest of 8 to 10 hours of sleep, 30 minute naps after meals. Can we all have that? That would be fantastic. Uh, decreased usual activity, such as housework, shopping, and exercise according to the classification. Prevent anemia because that increases the workload of the heart. Preventing constipation by increasing fluid and fiber. Um, stool softeners can be given. Avoid straining which causes that Valsalva maneuver. So when that breath is released, when she strains, that blood rushes to the heart, which can cause cardiac overload. We don't want that. Um, and continual assessment of the fetus starting at 30 to 32 weeks. During labor, keep a calm, quiet environment, decrease anxiety, keep informed of progress. Um, ABG is an O2 sat, assess her respiratory status, oxygenation during labor and delivery by a non-rebreathing mask. Make sure you give as much oxygen as you can because um, her she's, she's going to definitely use up all of her reserves. Um, promote cardiac function by minimizing anxiety. Uh, anticipatory guidance, supporting childbirth plan as much as feasible, relieve discomfort, um, make sure she's in the sideline position, monitor that fluid volume, straight up I's and O's on all IV fluids, um, anticipate the use of an epidural, 
usually stirrups are not used, um, but place the woman's feet flat on the bed. This will prevent compression of the popliteal veins. Mask oxygen is important. Um, oxytocin can be given, but methergine is avoided because they can increase blood pressure. And C-section only if fetal or maternal status is endangered. Here's you a nursing alert. Um, if so a pulse rate of 100 beats per minute or greater or a respiratory rate of 25 breaths per minute or greater is a concern. Check the respiratory status frequently for developing dyspnea, coughing, or crackles at the lung bases. Note the color and temperature of the skin as well. Pale, cool, clammy skin may indicate cardiac shock, and that is not a good sign. So the nurse will play a major role in recognizing the signs and symptoms of cardiac decompensation. Um, the pregnant woman is most vulnerable for complications um, around 32 weeks of gestation and in the first 48 hours postpartum. Signs and symptoms of cardiac decompensation are taught at the first prenatal visit and reviewed at each subsequent visit. In a normal pregnancy, blood volume will increase 40 to 50%, so 12 to 1500 milliliters possibly. Therefore, cardiac output increases by 30 to 45%. The heart will compensate by ventricular dilation and hypertrophy and tachycardia, which puts added stress on that already diseased heart. Um, again, the greatest stress is between 28 to 32 weeks, and those signs and symptoms can be increasing fatigue, difficulty breathing, feeling of smothering, she may need extra pillows, um, frequent moist cough with or without blood in um, her sputum, palpitations, feeling that her heart is racing, and edema. The immediate post-birth period is hazardous for a woman whose heart function is compromised. Cardiac output increases rapidly as extravascular fluid is remobilized into the vascular compartment. At the moment of birth, intra-abdominal pressure is reduced dramatically. Pressure on the veins is removed. Um, the vessels are engorged and the blood flow to the heart is increased. So you're gonna have to monitor for signs and symptoms of congestive heart failure. This can also occur seven to 14 days post delivery. You're gonna look for jugular vein distension, bounding pulse, moist rails, um, she may have reflex bradycardia when blood flow increases to the heart. Um, you're going to monitor vital signs, oxygen saturation, lung and breath sounds, edema, bleeding, definitely that uterine tone and fundal height, output, pain, especially if it's in the chest, activity, rest pattern, dietary intake, the interactions between mom and infant, she's probably going to be exhausted, um, emotional state, and she may need assistance with breastfeeding if she's class one or two. Normal blood pressure is less than 120 over 80. Prehypertensive is classified as greater than 120. Um, so 139 over 80, 89. 140. I'm sorry, let me take that back. Prehypertensive is greater than or equal to 120 to 139 systolic or 80 to 89 diastolic. Mild hypertension is classified as greater than 140 to 159 systolic, 90 to 99 diastolic. Severe hypertension is classified by being greater than 160 over 100. 25% of these women will develop preeclampsia. It is seen in older obese women. Pregnant hypertension meds, um, al aldamet or methyl dopa, it's slow acting and it actually will help to improve uterine perfusion. Also labetalol, atenolol, and nifedipine are given. Encourage lifestyle changes um, such as smoking, obesity, um, alcohol intake, caffeine intake, salt intake, use of NSAIDs, encourage 
to have this under control before she gets pregnant. It's seen more frequently um, now, and um, you are going to assess the vital signs and evaluate those that blood pressure in all three different positions, um, checking, lying, sitting, and standing. Hypertension during pregnancy will decrease the utero-placental perfusion. Um, you may encourage the dash dot, um, educate her on that. Um, a dot, a sodium, low sodium dot, daily rest periods, um, close monitoring during labor and birth, and postpartum follow-up. Asthma may be the most common potentially serious medical condition to complicate pregnancy. Prevalence and morbidity are increasing. The mortality has dropped in the recent years. There's a ton of medications that are given to help to, um, to keep that um, under control. It affects four to eight percent of pregnancies. So asthma is a chronic inflammatory disorder involving the tracheobronchial airways with increased airway responsiveness to a variety of stimuli. It's characterized by exacerbations and remissions. Um, it's unpredictable effect on pregnancy. If it worsens, the more severe symptoms usually occur between 17 and 24 weeks of gestation. Asthma appears to be associated with preterm birth, preeclampsia, small for gestational age, newborns, intrauterine growth restriction, and an increased rate of C-section. Um, teaching guidelines um, and common asthma triggers are in your book. Um, exacerbations are usually triggered by stimuli such as allergens, upper respiratory tract infections, medications, environmental pollutants, occupational exposures, exercise, cold air, or emotional stress. In response to those stimuli, there's a widespread but reversible narrowing of the hyperreactive airways and it makes it difficult to breathe. Um, you're going to see expiratory wheezing, productive cough, thick sputum, dyspnea, or any combination of those. The ultimate goal of asthma therapy is maintaining adequate oxygenation of the fetus by preventing hypoxic episodes in the mama. Um, so you're going to educate her to avoid or control those asthma triggers, um, educating her about the, um, the importance of controlling it during pregnancy. Inhaled corticosteroids is the preferred treatment during pregnancy. Um, medications are continued through labor in the postpartum period. Pulse ox should be instituted during labor. Epidurals are recommended for pain relief. Morphine and meperidine are uh, histamine releasing narcotics and should be avoided in these ladies. Fentanyl can be used as an alternative. Um, these women are at increased risk for hemorrhage. So um, sometimes they will be given carboprost and ergonavain and methylergonavain can cause bronchospasms and their use should be avoided. Um, only small amounts of asthma medications will enter the breast milk. Um, so it's not really an indi a contraindication to breastfeeding, um, though medications such as theophylline can cause vomiting, feeding difficulties, jitteriness, and cardiac arrhythmias. Tuberculosis, um, this affects one-third of the world's population. Um, all nurses need to be skilled in screening for and managing this condition. In pregnancy, TB treated early and adequately has outcomes equivalent to those in non-pregnant women. But if it is diagnosed late in pregnancy, studies report a fourfold increase in mortality. Um, inhalation of mycobacterium infected droplets. Basically, this infects the person, the lung, but also the lymph, meninges, 
bones, joints, and kidneys can be infected. It can lie dormant for long periods of time. Women can be asymptomatic. Um, women with untreated tuberculosis are more likely to have an underweight infant, an infant with a low APGAR score, and perinatal death. Um, prenatal diagnosis and treatment of the mother is essential. Streptomycin should be avoided during pregnancy because it is ototoxic to the fetus, so they, they could be born deaf. Um, usually the standard treatment is ethambital, azanazid, rifampicin, and pyrazinamide for two months, um, followed by four months of azanazid and rifampicin. Meds are the cornerstone of treatment, and it's so important to educate on compliance with that drug therapy um, because that's one of the biggest barriers to treatment. Um, mothers should not be in direct contact with their newborn until at least two weeks after starting an anti-tuberculin medication, and breastfeeding is not contraindicated. Untreated mothers can pump their milk to feed their newborns until they can breastfeed directly. Anemia in pregnancy is the most common medical disorder of pregnancy. Um, these moms will have increased risk for infection. They will have decreased oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. The heart rate will increase to compensate for that increase in cardiac output and workload of the heart, which in turn can result in congestive heart failure. Um, considered anemia if hemoglobin is less than 11 and hematocrit is less than 33. Blood loss will not be tolerated well. It is defined as a decrease in red blood cell mass. Um, the red blood cells function to deliver oxygen from the lungs to the tissues and carbon dioxide from the tissues to the lungs. In anemia, the decrease in the number of red blood cells transporting oxygen and carbon dioxide impairs the body's ability for gas exchange. It can be uh, a result from blood loss, increased destruction of red blood cells, or decreased production of red blood cells. Like fever, anemia is a sign that requires investigation. <clears throat> Each hemoglobin molecule consists of four iron-containing parts and four protein chains. Um, they, um, combine into oxygen saturation. Healthy adults will have um, a good hemoglobin and hematocrit level. <clears throat> However, we have these particular anemias that we will talk about in the next slides. Iron deficiency anemia is the primary cause of 75 to 95% of cases. Um, you have signs and symptoms of pallor, fatigue, lethargy, headache, inflammation of the lips and tongue, and pica, which is craving crazy things, such as dirt or washing powders. The effects on the fetus is unclear in iron deficiency anemia. The fetus usually has sufficient iron stores at cost to mother, but if it's severe, the fetus may have preterm birth or low birth weight. Treatment is supplemental iron therapy, usually with ferrous sulfate, 320 milligrams, one to three times a day. It's best to take that with a meal to decrease the chance of it upsetting her stomach. Um, also, taking with vitamin C can enhance absorption. Folic acid deficiency is, um, folic acid is essential for cell duplication in the making of red blood cells, um, fetal and placental development, and formation of red blood cells. The primary cause of megaloblastic anemia in pregnancy is decreased folic acid. It puts mom 
um, at increased risk for spontaneous abortion, abruptio placenta, and fetal anomalies, especially neural tube issues. So the best thing is for her to start taking folic acid supplements 400 micrograms per day before she gets pregnant. Megaloblastic anemia, um, this results from inhibition of DNA synthesis during red blood cell production. Um, the two most common causes are deficiencies in vitamin B12 or folate, which these two nutrients are necessary in producing healthy red blood cells. Treatment of megaloblastic anemia depends on the underlying cause. Um, may need to give um, vitamin B12 supplements or folic acid supplements. Some medications can actually cause folate deficiency. Um, a couple of those are fentoin, metformin, phenobarbital, um, trimethoprim, pyrimethamine, methotrexate, uh, sulfonamides, and valproic acid. So when you're doing your assessment, you may see pallor in the hand. Um, there is a picture on your screen. Uh, the back of the hand, you can see um, some pallor. Also the inner palm, the major hand lines, the fingernails. Interestingly, there's another hand characteristic um, that is associated with anemia, and it is called coilonica or spoon nails, and it is caused by chronic severe iron deficiency. Here is a picture of that. The anemic client often complains of lightheadedness, shortness of breath on exertion, and possibly soreness of mouth and tongue. On physical examination, you may see pallor. Um, you may see an increased pulse rate. Um, so signs and symptoms can be Fatigue, pica, pallor, multiple gestation, poor quality and quantity of dietary intake, poor concentration, restless leg syndrome, headache, tachycardia, um, and it, it actually can be caused by multiple gestation and short space pregnancies. Sorry about that. The iron deficiency anemia is, again, the most common anemia of pregnancy. Um, it is diagnosed by checking the ferritin level in the blood. Um, it can be falsely high due to inflammation and infection, um, but you will see a decrease in red blood cells and hemoglobin and hematocrit. Um, basically, the um, serum ferritin it's an intracellular protein that stores iron and releases it in a controlled fashion. Um, the primary intracellular storage protein keeping iron in a soluble and non-toxic form. Normal is 12 to 300 in men and 12 to 150 in women. And if the body uses up the iron that is stored in ferritin, then it cannot make hemoglobin. Um, People living at higher altitudes have higher normal values. A low H and H level is a late indicator of iron deficiency. If the serum ferritin levels are less than 12, that indicates a pretty severe um, decrease in the iron reserves. Generally, iron deficiency anemia is preventable and easily treated with iron supplements, but because it is so hard on your stomach, um, a lot of times it will have to be given IV. Um, if the mom is very anemic and nausea and vomiting prevents absorption, you can also give it to them IM. Um, possibly need a blood transfusion if it is very severe. Cooking in iron pots can increase the iron content of foods, which is kind of cool. Um, this source of dietary iron is called contamination iron. Um, it is uh, found in clams, oysters, livers, liver, 
which pregnant women shouldn't eat because of the high vitamin A levels. Um, in animal foods, iron is often attached to proteins called heme proteins and, re and referred to as heme iron. Um, even though, so non-heme iron is pumpkin seeds, tofu, beans, blackstrap molasses, um, and that's plant foods, different things that um, you can get iron from. Thalassemia is insufficient amount of hemoglobin is produced to fill the red blood cells, resulting in decreased lifespan life of red blood cells. It's an inherited disorder, and it involves abnormal synthesis of the alpha or beta chains of hemoglobin. So in thalassemia, um, the synthesis of one or both chains of the hemoglobin molecule, alpha, beta, is defective. Um, there's two forms, so there's alpha, minor, beta, major. It results in severe bone deformities caused by massive narrow tissue expansion. The beta type is the most common um, hereditary. Most women will be sterile with beta thalassemia. Um, pregnancy will not worsen the disease nor be compromised by it if she can even get pregnant. Um, it does not respond to iron therapy, and there is no specific treatment. Usually, she will just have um, mild anemia, um, a low hemoglobin, and a microcytic hypochromic anemia results. Um, so the MCHC on the CBC labs is a mean corpuscular hemoglobin. This is... Um, this is the measurement of how much hemoglobin is inside one red blood cell. So it's basically the mass of the, red, the hemoglobin. Mean corpuscular volume, or MCV, is the measurement of the size of the red blood cell. Low indicates thalassemia, especially if iron deficiency anemia is ruled out. In pernicious anemia, MCV can range up to 150. An elevated MCV is also associated with alcoholism. Vitamin B12 and or folic acid deficiency has also been associated with high MCV numbers. Thalassemia is more common in Mediterranean, Asian, Italian, Greek, and Northern African. Uh, beta thalassemia is the most common form found um, make sure that they are taking their folic acid, rest, supportive care, expected management, make sure you're monitoring that cardiac function, also iron levels. Sickle cell is um, a disease in which the red blood cell lifespan um, because it is only five to 10 days, and if it's not iron deficient, it can develop, develop overload. This is an autosomal recessive inherited condition. It results from a defective hemoglobin molecule. The blood is screened with um, hemoglobin electrophoresis at the first prenatal visit. These, these moms are prone to preeclampsia Prematurity and intrauterine growth restriction are common and fetal death if severe crisis occurs. Treatment is close monitoring, may require transfusions, adequate hydration and nutrition, and prevention of infection, rest, and oxygen during labor. One in 12 African Americans have the trait. One in every 500 African American births have the disease. Um, usually, women with sickle cell trait do well with pregnancy, but they are, again, at risk for preeclampsia, eclampsia, abruption, uh, low birth weight, and postpartum endometri endometritis. Um, also at risk for UTIs and iron deficiency. Um, mainly affects people of African or Mediterranean ancestry. 
a normal lifespan of the red blood cells is 120 days. However, in sickle cell, it's only five to 10. Um, it is, people can have recurrent attacks of fever and pain, most often in the abdomen, joints, extremities, pretty much any organ can be affected. Um, it causes vascular occlusion when those red blood cells um, sickle or become into a sickle shape. It can be brought on by trauma, infection, fever, acidosis, dehydration, physical exertion, excessive cold exposure, hypoxia, um, and significant anemia. Complications can occur at any time during gestation, labor, and birth, or postpartum. Um, this is believed to be secondary to hormonal modifications, hypercoagulability of pregnancy, and increased susceptibility to infection. Microvascular sickling in the placental circulation is associated with miscarriages, placental abruption, preeclampsia, preterm labor, intrauterine growth restriction, fetal distress. The nurse should be alert for symptoms of anemia as well as indicators of sickle cell crisis, which you may see as severe abdominal pain. Um, crises are managed with analgesia, oxygen, and hydration. A vaginal birth is preferred. Make sure that you are um, giving her adequate hydration, um, avoiding temperature extremes, uh, meticulous hand washing to decrease that and to decrease the risk of infection. Also, anti-embolism stockings after birth can help to prevent clot formation. Um, and then also, women with sickle cell anemia are not iron deficient, so routine iron supplementation should be avoided in these women. Autoimmune disorders are a group of more than 80 distinct diseases that emerge when the immune system launches an immune response against its own self. Um, they can occur during pregnancy because a large number of women with autoimmune disease are women of childbearing age. So some of the common um, autoimmune diseases is um, myasthenia gravis, um, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and systemic sclerosis. Localized disorders will target specific organs and systemic disorders will affect multiple organs. This is a picture of systemic lupus erythematosus. It is a chronic relapsing autoimmune disease of the connective tissues that can affect various organs such as the skin, joints, kidneys, lungs, nervous system, liver, and serosal membranes. More often in women than men, 80% are women. Um, it affects the age group of 15 to 45. Triggers that activate include estrogen, cigarette smoking, infections, physical or psychologic stress, exposure to UV light, and pregnancy. You will see symptoms such as myalgia, extreme fatigue, swollen joints, oral ulcers, skin rashes, sensitivity to light, weight change, and fevers. It will be diagnosed by circulating antibodies. <clears throat> in pregnancy, inflammation of the connective tissue of the decidua can result in placental implantation problems and poor functioning. So disease activity at the beginning of pregnancy is an important predictor of exacerbations during pregnancy. Women are advised to wait until they have been in remission for at least six months before attempting pregnancy. Mom risks include miscarriage, stillbirth, fetal death, nephritis, preeclampsia, um, need to give birth at preterm gestation, and an increased risk of C-section. Fetal risks are stillbirth, intrauterine growth restriction, and preterm birth. 
The nurse needs to watch um, during pregnancy for hypertension, proteinuria, intrauterine growth restriction, um, a flare-up of SLE. Um, women can flare during labor, um, and if she has received um, the glucocorticoid therapy, she needs larger stress doses of steroids during labor. Uh, C-section is common, but a vaginal birth is preferred. Energy conservation, frequent and close monitoring, um, birth control and support groups, and um, education is needed. Multiple sclerosis is a patchy, chronic, inflammatory demyelination of the spinal cord and central nervous system. Um, the uncomplicated MS does not have adverse events on fertility, labor, or birth. Um, the onset of symptoms is usually subtle with weakness in the lower extremities, visual complaints, loss of coordination, usually occurs between 20 and 40 years old. The focus of MS therapy is to prevent a relapse and postpone neurodegeneration. Anti-inflammatories, immunosuppressants, immunomodulators, and biologic agents um, are used. Most meds that are used in MS treatment are not FDA approved during pregnancy, um, but they ha many have been used and have not shown any adverse effect. Clinical presentation of MS, you will see fatigue, weakness, constipation, urinary frequency, balance problems, back pain, and visual changes. Exacerbation is more likely in the third trimester or postpartum. Um, treated again by corticosteroids and immunosuppressive agents, also interferon. Women paraplegic from MS are more likely to develop UTIs with pregnancy, but may feel no symptoms. Breastfeeding is encouraged, although medications that are lactation risk category L5 should not be prescribed. IVIG is considered safe for use during lactation. Um, and all hormonal contraceptives may be used by women with MS. <coughs> Rheumatoid arthritis is one of the most common chronic autoimmune disorders. It's characterized by joint inflammation and progressive disability. It affects the synovial joints and tissues of the hands and feet, but any joint can be involved over time and because it's chronic. Bone and cartilage are damaged. Chronic inflammation happens, resulting in joint deformity and loss of functioning. It presents usually between the ages of 30 and 50. The course of rheumatoid arthritis during pregnancy is usually benign. Three, three quarters of pregnancy symptoms lessen. Others continue to need medication. Um, it does not adversely affect pregnancy outcome, but it usually returns three to four months postpartum. Treatment is to focus on reducing joint inflammation, managing pain, and preventing joint destruction. Uh, medications such as NSAIDs, glucocorticoids, hydroxychloroquine, methotrexate, immunomodulators, biologic agents are given. Um, during pregnancy, medications are usually limited to hydroxychloroquine, glucocorticoids, and NSAIDs. Methotrexate is contraindicated in pregnancy. The most common viral and non-viral infections affecting pregnancy. These are differences in viral and bacterial infections. Cytomegalo cytomegalovirus is the most common congenital and perinatal infection in the world. It can affect almost anyone. Um, it 
rarely causes symptoms, so most people don't even know that they have it. But if you are pregnant or have a weakened immune system, uh, CMV is cause for concern because it is the leading cause of congenital infection with comorbidity and mortality at birth. Once you are infected with CMV, your body will retain the virus for life, but usually remains dormant if you're healthy. It spreads from person to person through body fluids, uh, such as blood, saliva, urine, semen, and breast milk. CMV spread through breast milk usually doesn't make the baby sick. However, if you're pregnant and develop the active infection, you can pass the virus to your baby. Uh, the risk of serious fetal injury is greatest when maternal infection develops in the first or early second trimester while the baby is developing. CMV during pregnancy can result in abortion, stillbirth, low birth weight, intrauterine growth restriction, microcephaly, deafness, blindness, intellectual disability, jaundice, congenital or neonatal infection. Um, if it occurs during pregnancy, it is the most dangerous to the fetus and has a 30 to 40% chance of being infected. Most survivors have long-term complications, um, such as hearing loss and intellectual disability. There is no cure for CMV, but drugs can help treat newborns and people with weak immune systems. Babies with congenital CMV who are sick at birth tend to be extremely sick. Signs and symptoms, you may see yellow skin and eyes, purple skin splotches or a rash, um, a low birth weight, enlarged spleen, enlarged and poorly functioning liver, seizures. Treatment is with gencyclovir. Um, this is effective in decreasing, decreasing the neurologic sequelae and hearing loss. The rising rates of genital herpes infections is increasing the rising rates of newborn herpes simplex virus infection. There is a 50% mortality rate if neonatal exposure is with an active primary infection. Once the, the virus enters the body, it never leaves. Almost one in four pregnant women is affected, but most do not know it. Only a small number pass the infection onto their newborns. The greatest risk is if the mom develops a primary infection near term and it is not recognized. Most neonatal infections are acquired at or around the time of birth. Um, if there are active herpetic lesions at or near term, a C-section will always be planned. Avoid all invasive procedures um, such as um, rupturing of membranes, artificial rupturing of membranes, a scalp lead, forceps. Uh, no therapy can eradicate HSV and it is noted for its frequent asymptomatic viral shedding. Transmission can result in severe neurologic impairment or death. Treatment of the mother with an antiviral agent such as a cyclovir must be started as soon as the culture comes back positive. Hepatitis B, um, the virus is 100 times more infective than HIV. Unlike HIV, it can live outside the body in dried blood for more than a week. Acutely affected women develop hepatitis with nausea, vomiting, fever, abdominal pain, and jaundice. Vertical transmission occurs in 10% of newborns if the infection occurs in the first trimester and 80 to 90% of infants if acute infection occurs in the third trimester. Um, without intervention, most infants born to women who are positive for hepatitis B will have chronic hepatitis B by six months of age. It is not associated with malformation, stillborn, or intrauterine growth restriction. It is associated with prematurity fetal distress in labor, meconium peritonitis, low birth weight, and neonatal death. Transmission can occur through breast milk, but antigens also develop in formula-fed infants at the same or a higher rate, so breastfeeding is not contraindicated. Diagnosis is made by a viral culture of the amniotic fluid. The CDC recommends all pregnant women be tested for hepatitis B virus. Infants born to hepatitis um, 
positive mothers should receive a single antigen HBV and hepatitis B immunoglobulin within 12 hours after birth. Permanent remission of the disease, even with treatment, rare, rarely occurs. So therapy is directed at long-term suppression of viral replication and prevention of end-stage liver disease. A high protein diet um, is encouraged and also to avoid fatigue. If a woman does test positive for the virus, um, expect to administer the HPV immunoglobulin. Um, they, those who are negative for the antigen, or I'm sorry, the antibody, um, can be vaccinated safely during pregnancy. Varicella zoster virus, this is a member of the herpes family. Approximately 90% of women in the childbearing years are immune. Therefore, the risk of infection in pregnancy is low. If the mom contracts the disease in the first half of the pregnancy, transmission to the fetus can occur across the placenta, though this is very rare. It can cause limb atrophy, neuroabnormalities, and eye abnormalities. Maternal infection in the last three weeks of pregnancy, 23% of the infants born will develop clinical varicella. Because the effects of the varicella virus on the fetus are really unknown, pregnant women should not be vaccinated. Non-pregnant women who are vaccinated should avoid becoming pregnant for one month after each injection. Group B streptococcus, um, this is the leading cause of neonatal morbidity and mortality in the USA. Prophylactic antibiotics decrease the incidence and severity of infection in newborns. Um, rupture of membranes greater than 18 hours increases the risk for infection. Monitor mother's vital signs and report any maternal fever greater than 100.4. Ensure that the pregnant woman has been screened. Um, early onset GBS in the neonate commonly manifests itself in the first 24 hours after birth, but it can wait for as long as seven days. Infants can develop pneumonia, sepsis, shock, and meningitis. Mortality rate for early onset infection is 5 to 20 percent. Late onset, one week to three months, um, 30 percent of those develop meningitis and survivors often have nerve damage. Um, moms are screened for GBS between 35 and 37 weeks or sooner if she's at high risk. Parvovirus B19, it is a common self-limiting benign childhood virus that causes erythema infectiosum or Fifth's disease. 65% of women are immune but this can cause spontaneous abortion and fetal anemia. There is no treatment available. Um, it is spread transplacentally, oropharyngeal route, and casual contact also through blood. The risk is greatest when the woman is infected in the first 20 weeks of gestation. Toxoplasmosis is a widespread parasitic infection with Toxoplasma gondii. Dogs and cats, sheep, pig, and cattle are hosts. Protozoan can pose serious risk through contaminated soil, uncooked meat or seafood, and also changing cat litter boxes. Uh, the woman is usually asymptomatic. If it is contracted for the first time during pregnancy, there is a 40% risk of passing the infection to her fetus. 30% of neonates have severe manifestations such as hydrocephalus, chorioretinitis, and cerebral calcifications. The earlier in pregnancy that it is contracted, the greater the severity of congenital disease. Severe toxoplasmosis is associated with preterm birth, microthalamus, and petechiae rash. Diagnosis in the neonate um, is by increased levels of IgM in the core blood serum. Most neonates are asymptomatic at birth, then develop chorioretinitis and signs of CNS involvement, learning disabilities, 
um, low birth weight, enlarged liver and spleen, jaundice, intrauterine growth restriction, neurological damage, microcephaly, and anemia. Um, treatment during pregnancy is pyrimethamine with oral sulfadazine. Also giving folic acid supplementation to prevent anemia and prevention is key. AIDS is the leading, third leading cause of death among women aged 25 to 44 years in the U.S. and the leading cause of death among African American women in this age group. There are three recognized modes of transmission, unprotected sex with an infected partner, contact with infected blood or blood products, and perinatal transmission. Severe depression of the immune system associated with an HIV infection um, characterizes AIDS. A woman should be assessed for possibility of HIV exposure. Once HIV enters the body, um, seroconversion uh, to HIV positivity usually occurs within 6 to 12 weeks. They may be symptomatic, but usually accompanied by a um, influenza-like response, so fever, headache, night sweats, malaise, generalized lymphadenopathy, myalgia, nausea, diarrhea, weight loss, sore throat, and rash can occur. Um, labs, you may see leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, anemia, an increased sed rate. HIV has a strong affinity for surface marker proteins on the T lymphocytes, um, leading to significant T, T cell destructions. Um, also, declining CD4 levels are strongly associated with AIDS-related cases. Transmission of the virus from mother to child can occur through the perinatal period as early as the first trimester to during labor and birth to breast milk. Universal screening is recommended. Um, antiretroviral medication reduces perinatal transmission significantly um, with Zytovan. Um, it, it reduces the viral loads in the blood. It's given in the prenatal and perinatal periods. Also, heart therapy during pregnancy has decreased mother to child transmission to 1 to 2 percent. That is the triple drug antiretroviral therapy or highly active antiretroviral therapy. All pregnant women should be treated with a combination of ART during pregnancy regardless of their CD4 counts. Worldwide, over 2,000 new infections due to mother-to-child transmission occur daily. Perinatal transmission rates are as high as 35% without ART and below 1% with ART and appropriate care. 82% of women with HIV or AIDS are African American and Hispanic. With perinatal transmission, approximately half of children manifest AIDS within the first year of life, and about 80% have clinical symptoms of the disease within, the, within three to five years and breastfeeding is a major factor in transmission. Vulnerable populations are clearly adolescents, um, pregnant women over the age of 35, obese pregnant women, women who are positive for HIV, and women who abuse substances. From 2011 to 2012, Adolescent pregnancy had a historic low of 29.4%. Worldwide, 11% of births to adolescents um, belong to those in between 15 and 19 years old. <clears throat> Infants more likely to be born preterm and have low birth weight with higher mortality rates, serious and long-term disabilities, and dying during the first year of life are born to pregnant adolescents. Um, this can be attributed to inexperience, lack of knowledge, and immaturity. With adequate support and education, um, mom can learn effective parenting skills. Um, she will also need strong social and functional support. Adolescent mothers provide warm and attentive physical care. However, they use less verbal interaction than older parents. They tend to be less responsive, interact less positively with their infants than older mothers. 
Interventions emphasizing verbal and nonverbal communication skills between mother and infant are so important. They tend to expect too much of their infant too soon. They are less likely to receive adequate prenatal care, often no prenatal care. They're more likely to smoke and they're less likely to gain weight during pregnancy. Um, you can look at box 20.3. Um, Latinas actually have the highest teen birth rate and um, loss of self-esteem is a major impact. Also peer pressure to become sexually active increases uh, pregnant adolescents. The role of the nurse is to reduce risks and consequences, encourage early and continued prenatal care, provide early and ongoing education regarding pregnancy, birth, and parenting, and refer if necessary for appropriate social support services. Um, programs that make a difference um, involve the parents and other adults in the community, promote abstinence and personal responsibility, assist adolescents to develop a clear strategy for reaching goals, uh, such as college education or career. There's two groups. Um, you have unintentionally or intentionally multiparous during their perimenopausal period. And you also have primigravids that deliberately delayed or were unable to conceive due to fertility problems and became pregnant through assisted reproductive technology. These um, are at risk for stillbirth, miscarriage, diabetes, hypertension, placentia, placenta previa, abruption, and uh, C-sections. Babies are at increased risk of chromosomal abnormalities, low birth weight, intrauterine growth restriction, um, low APGAR scores. So with these moms, um, they call them advanced maternal age mothers. Um, you're going to educate about the risk factors, especially with the genetics. Um, encourage her to modify lifestyle issues if she is doing anything that's not healthy for baby. Um, usually they will have an amniocentesis to rule out any chromosomal abnormalities. And women over 35 years of age are at increased risk for spontaneous abortion. Obesity also um, has very, very, very bad um, effects on mom and baby. Uh, gestational diabetes, women who are obese are more likely to have diabetes that develops during pregnancy um, than are women who have a normal weight. Preeclampsia, women who are obese are at increased risk of developing a pregnancy complication. Um, with high blood pressure and kidneys, ish, um, kidney damage. They are also at increased risk of urinary tract infections, um, at risk for postpartum infections, whether the baby is delivered vaginally or by C-section. Obesity can increase the risk that pregnancy will continue beyond the expected due date. Labor induction is more common in women who are obese. Uh, obesity during pregnancy increases the likelihood of elective and emergency C-sections. Um, it also increases the risk of C-section complications such as wound infections. Women who are obese are also less likely to have a successful vaginal delivery after a C-section, also called a VBAC. And obesity can increase the risk of miscarriage. Pregnant women, women with substance abuse issues uh, impose significant fetal and neonatal risks. Other than alcohol and tobacco, cocaine and marijuana are the most commonly used substances by pregnant women. Um, substance abuse can be viewed along a continuum between social recreational drug use and addiction. 
Prenatal care is critical, but women may not seek care for fear of being reported to Child Protective Services. Along with a mother, the fetus experiences substance abuse, um, substance use, abuse, and addiction. Vulnerability is greater because they are not mature enough to metabolize the drugs. Any use of alcohol or illicit drugs during pregnancy is considered abuse. Tobacco, alcohol, and marijuana are the most common. Um, also, also dual diagnosis of major depression and anxiety orders, um, you will see that quite often. Alcohol and other drugs easily pass from patient to fetus through the placenta. Smoking may have serious health risks such as bleeding complications, abortion, stillbirth, prematurity, low birth weight, and SIDS. <coughs> Prenatal exposure to nicotine may lead to dysregulation of neurodevelopment of the child and they are at higher risk for developmental problems, development, I'm sorry, behavioral problems. Congenital abnormalities have also occurred with drug use. Um, safest pregnancy is one in which the patient is totally drug and alcohol free, except for patients addicted to opiates. Methadone maintenance is safer for the fetus than an acute opiate detox. Caucasians are more likely to abuse alcohol. African Americans are more likely to use illicit drugs, especially cocaine. Barriers to treatment, um, social stigma, labeling, and guilt are significant barriers. Uh, fear of losing custody of the child or criminal prosecution. Often, mom does not understand the effects of the substance on herself, her pregnancy, or her baby. It is estimated that the fetus gets 50% of the maternal dose and experiences the same effects as the mother, but often is more severe. Often, um, it goes undiagnosed because she does not seek prenatal care until late in pregnancy or when labor begins, if at all. Um, may receive negative feedback from her healthcare provider and society. Um, the healthcare provider may condemn them for endangering the life of the fetus and may even withhold support. Treatment programs do not always address issues that affect pregnant women, such as concurrent um, care and child care for other children. There also may be long waiting list or lack of insurance coverage, and she may be non-compliant. Um, legal considerations, because of the risk to the fetus and financial concerns, she may face criminal charges um, under expanded interpretations of child abuse and drug trafficking laws. South Carolina is the only state criminalizing pregnant patients who abuse substances. Others have mandates of reporting to child welfare authorities or defining child neglect to include cases in which newborn is physically dependent, tests positive for, or has been harmed by substance abuse. In 25 stated cases of maternal drug or alcohol use are referred to social worker who evaluates and determines whether it is safe for the child to be taken home. It's better to encourage prenatal care, counseling, and treatment. If a positive drug screen at time of delivery may have to report the child to Child Protective Services. <coughs> um, also fetal alcohol syndrome, um, because ethanol easily crosses the placenta, um, drinkers are at a higher risk of congenital abnormalities than moderate drinkers. And alcohol withdrawal occurs in neonates, especially if the mother drinks at birth time. With caffeine, it is encouraged um, no more than 300 milligrams per day, um, but coffee does decrease iron absorption. There is caffeine in Cokes, Coca-Cola, Cherry Coke, Lemon Coke, da da da, coffee, tea, chocolate, and energy drinks. Cocaine is a small molecule. It's able to cross the placenta into the bloodstream of the fetus. 
Um, in fact, it may be present in a higher concentration in the amniotic fluid than it is in the mother's bloodstream. The skin is, um, of the fetus is able to absorb the chemical directly from the amniotic fluid until the 24th week of pregnancy. Cocaine can also show up in breast milk and affect a nursing baby. The severity of the effects depends on how much of the drug is used, how often, and the stage of the development of the fetus. Neonatal abstinence syndrome um, causes withdrawal symptoms. In the neonate, you will see CNS irritability, hypertonicity, high-pitched cry, and tremors. Um, also respiratory distress, excessive sneezing, GI dysfunction, vomiting, diarrhea, feeding disturbances. Um, there are more severe um, symptoms if they're exposed to larger amounts over a longer period of time. Uh, the severity of the withdrawal is also related to the timing of the maternal drug use in relation to birth. Drug use close to time of birth increases the severity of withdrawal, but delays the onset of symptoms. Withdrawal of opiates during pregnancy is extremely dangerous for the fetus, so a prescribed oral methadone maintenance program combined with psychotherapy is recommended. Um, also, be careful giving Stadol or Narcan, which can have narcotic antagonist properties. So, definitely assess moms. Um, probably will be doing a urine drug screen, but have a non-judgmental approach for these moms. Um, more than likely, a state protection agency will have an investigation especially if the newborn drug screen is positive. Um, and that's pretty much it on that. Is the following statement true or false? A woman who develops diabetes during pregnancy is said to have type 2 diabetes. The answer is false. A woman who develops diabetes during pregnancy is said to have gestational diabetes. Is the following statement true or false? A woman with class 2 heart disease would have symptoms with increased activity. This is true. Uh, she would be symptomatic when she increases her physical activity. When assessing a pregnant woman with iron deficiency anemia, which would the nurse expect to find? The answer is fatigue. The pregnant woman with iron deficiency anemia typically has fatigue, malaise, weakness, anorexia, susceptibility to infection, pale mucous membranes, tachycardia, and pallor. Is the following statement true or false? A pregnant woman who is HIV positive must undergo a cesarean birth. The answer is false. Although it is recommended for the pregnant woman who is HIV positive, the decision concerning the method of delivery should be based on the woman's viral load, duration of ruptured membranes, progress of labor, and other pertinent clinical factors. And that is it. Have a good day.